medcram.com. Well, welcome to another MedCram video. We're going to talk about influenza or the flu, and it is off the charts, as you can see on this map here, ending November 26, 2022. States that are in purple are very high in influenza. As of this date, since October, 8.7 million illnesses, 78,000 hospitalization, and 4,500 deaths since October. If we look at the flu vaccine efficacy for last year in 2021 to 2022, we're looking at about a 34 to 35% efficacy, which means that we cannot depend on just the vaccine for the flu. And for those of you who are familiar with MedCram, know that we take a Swiss cheese model approach, meaning that stacking a bunch of Swiss cheese slices, each with their own holes, is better than just depending on one slice of cheese. As we've done with COVID, we've talked about sunlight in a number of our videos. So you can see here, light as medicine, infrared light, vitamin D, sunlight for COVID, infrared light and spike toxicity, and vitamin D and autoimmune diseases. We're big believers that there is something about sunlight that can be very protective with not only COVID, but as we're going to find out here with influenza as well. So we're going to talk in this video about not only sunlight, but also some other things that you can do for the flu, including N-acetylcysteine and some other prescription medications, which we'll review here as well, so that you're fully armed with the knowledge of what to do in the flu. So let's talk about our first paper here. This was a paper that was published in 2021 in Economics and Human Biology, titled Sunlight and Protection Against Influenza. And this was published out of the University of Kansas and Harvard University. And what they wanted to do was look at, over the years, the flu, and see whether or not sunlight was protective. And so this was an interesting study because depending on where you live in the United States and what week it is during that year, you're going to get an average amount of sunlight. So let's say somebody in the beginning of November is going to experience different sunlight in New York than they would in Texas. But there's an average at both of those places. The thing that would be an intrinsic factor that you couldn't control for is in those places, what would be the deviation from that average in particular years? And in those particular years, was there an increased amount of the flu or a decreased amount of the flu with increasing levels of sunlight and decreasing levels of sunlight in that state at that latitude? So you can see here, they said here, ideally, an econometric study would run a two-stage instrument variable analysis where the first stage used sunlight to predict vitamin D levels, and the second stage used predicted vitamin D levels to predict influenza. Unfortunately, we lack any large-scale geotag data on vitamin D levels. In its stead, our analysis employs a reduced form estimate of sunlight's impact on influenza. Given that sunlight levels in a geographic area for a particular week vary randomly over the different years, this provides us with robust estimates. So let's take a look and see what they did. They looked at all of the different flu epidemics or flu seasons, including the 2009, which we'll talk more about. And you can see here, going from 2008 all the way down to 2018, they plotted it out based on the week of the calendar year. You can see there's some outliers here, but for the majority of them, the flu peaks right there at around the beginning of the year, around week one. But there were some that peaked early, like this one, and that's the 2009. Now, for those of you who don't remember, we had a H1N1 pandemic in 2009. That was a shift, not a drift year, which means that there was a, an antigenic shift that year that really caught a lot of people off guard. And it was early. There were some interesting things about 2009, which we'll talk about, specifically that it was a cooler year in terms of the amount of sunlight that was coming in. So what they did is they looked in each of these years and plotted, was there more sun or less sun at each particular week in each particular state? And when they graph that out, this is what they found. You can see here a lot of the data that makes up this slope was from these red dots, which was from 2009. And a lot of these dots were down here, so there was a lot of variability. And what they found is that as you go from the baseline sunlight level, as you start to go down in terms of log difference, there was an increase in the state week mean flu index. So state week meaning that state in that week, what's the average, and how did it vary based on different years? And you can see here clearly there was a reduction in the amount of flu if you had more sunlight. So they took this data and they applied it to a state that they actually had a lot of data on, and that was in the state of New York. 
Of course, there's going to be less variation, so it's going to be a little bit flatter. But you can see also, as sunlight went up in certain weeks in New York, there was a reduction in the flu index. And when there was a reduction in light, there was an increase. So that led them to the conclusion that sunlight was protective against the flu. They say, therefore, apart from its methodological contributions, this study reinforces the long-held assertion that vitamin D protects against acute upper respiratory infections. One can secure vitamin D through supplements or through a walk outdoors, particularly on a day when the sun shines brightly. When most walk, herd protection provides benefit to all. This idea that it's vitamin D that's doing the heavy lifting is an assumption. There are many aspects of light from the sun. We've talked about this in our video on light as medicine, which I highly encourage you to watch. It will be eye-opening to understand that near-infrared radiation, which is the majority of the energy from the sun, is hypothesized to actually create melatonin production in the mitochondria based on some data. Now, that's still a hypothesis and needs to be formalized out but we do know that melatonin is produced on site in the mitochondria. And we do know that there are long-term benefits of sun exposure in the population. Whether it's through a vitamin D pathway or not, it would seem to me that getting outside would be the right thing to do, especially this time of year when the sun is so scarce. So here's another study that was published back in 2009. Interestingly, it was in a pandemic year, the H1N1. And here they're looking at the 1918 to 1919 influenza pandemic in the United States. And here they were looking at ultraviolet B radiation, again, looking at the vitamin D pathway. So what they did is they looked at a number of cities in the United States at that time, the number of influenza cases, the number of pneumonia cases. Remember, this is before antibiotics, so once you've got pneumonia, you've got about a 50% chance of living. Here's the influenza case fatality rate per 100 cases, the pneumonia complication percentage rate, the July ultraviolet B dosing, and also the latitude. So remember now, latitude, if you look at the globe, latitude here is zero at the equator and 90. So the higher the latitude goes, the less ultraviolet B dose you're going to get. So these two columns right here are going to be inversely proportional to each other, generally speaking. Let's see what they found. They published this in table two, and it showed in terms of the case fatality rates, the R, or the correlation coefficient, if you will, was negative. That means that as ultraviolet B light went up, the case fatality rate went down, and that was statistically significant. But there was a positive correlation between latitude and case fatality rate. In other words, the further away you went from the equator, the higher the case fatality rate was. Same thing happened in terms of pneumonia as a complication from influenza. The more ultraviolet B radiation you had, the less pneumonia as a complication of influenza. The higher in latitude you went, the higher the pneumonia complication of influenza. So again, we're seeing here that there is definitely a connection between sunlight and influenza, not just COVID, but also influenza. This is kind of interesting in terms of that publication. The acknowledgments was that one of the authors actually received funding from the Ultraviolet Foundation, the Vitamin D Society in Canada, and the European Sunlight Association in Brussels. I didn't even know those organizations existed. But we have talked about this before, and in a number of videos, we've talked about not only the effect of sunlight with influenza as we are now, but also the effect of sunlight on COVID. And we showed you this study that was done. And again, the point here that I want to make is that it may not be vitamin D doing the heavy lifting. There could be other factors. In this paper that was published, it showed that when they eliminated the portion of the United States where people can get enough vitamin D in the wintertime, they still noticed, now looking at ultraviolet A radiation, correcting for population density, case proportion transportation, age, ethnicity, and comorbidities, correcting for all of that, what they noticed was that as the amount of UVA went up, the COVID deaths per million went down, as you can see. And they saw this again in England, prospectively. Of course, they didn't have to block out people who got vitamin D enough in the wintertime because that doesn't happen in England. It's so far north. And also they found this reproduced in Italy as well. The more ultraviolet A radiation that you receive, the less you have COVID-19 deaths per million. This was independent of a vitamin D pathway 
And that led the authors to say that if this relationship was causal, it suggests that optimizing sun exposure may be a possible public health intervention. And I would say not just for COVID-19, but also influenza. And in fact, as I've shown you before in other videos, we've been doing this for a long time. These are photographs that go back 100 years or more, and it shows that we've kind of known that sunlight exposure is actually pretty beneficial. And again, I would recommend that you go back and look at those videos, especially Light as Medicine, which is pretty comprehensive, but also vitamin D if you're interested in learning about vitamin D. Let's talk about NAC. So NAC is N-acetylcysteine, N-A-C. We actually did a video on NAC, which I highly recommend that you watch. It's basically an antioxidant that recharges your glutathione system. This was a randomized controlled trial published in a prestigious journal back in 1997, the European Respiratory Journal. And what they did is over a winter period for about six months, they gave 262 subjects of both sexes suffering from non-respiratory chronic degenerative diseases, either NAC 600 milligrams twice daily or a placebo. And what they found was that there was no difference between these two groups in terms of who got infected with influenza. But what they found is that whereas in the placebo group, 79% of those people developed symptomatic forms of influenza, in the NAC group, only 25% developed a symptomatic form. So in other words, N-acetylcysteine, 600 milligrams twice daily for six months, was able to significantly reduce the symptomatic response of somebody who got infected. It doesn't prevent infection, but it prevents the severity of the symptomatology of that infection. There's been a lot of theories that perhaps N-acetylcysteine might also be beneficial in COVID-19 because of the oxidative stress nature of that disease as well. So let's round out the discussion and talk about some prescription medications that may actually be beneficial if you get influenza. Let's say you've got the vaccine and it doesn't work. You get influenza. What can you possibly do? Or let's say you're fine and you've been exposed to somebody in your household who has just tested positive for influenza. Take any of these medications. When you have influenza, that's known as treatment. We'll talk about that. But if you take it before you get the flu or you take it to try to prevent yourself from getting the flu, that's known as chemoprophylaxis. The big four that we should talk about in 2022 to 2023 are these four right here. And they're divided into the neuraminidase inhibitors, which basically prevents the virus from binding into the cell. Neuraminidase is one of those enzymes that's responsible for attachment onto the cell. And then there's this thing called the cap-dependent endonuclease inhibitors. So cap-dependent endonuclease inhibitors are substances that block the ability of the virus to use mRNA from the host cell as a method of translating its genome into its viral proteins. It's known as cap snatching, kind of an interesting term. We've talked before about the molecular biology of the cell. The cell that the virus infects is going to be making messenger RNA. And all those messenger RNAs in the nucleus are going to have a five prime cap. They have to because RNA polymerase, those enzymes out in the cytosol, RNA polymerases, specifically the ribosomes out in the cytosol, are going to need that five prime cap to know that they need to translate that messenger RNA. The virus doesn't have that five prime cap, so it just takes it from the cell that it infects. That's called cap snatching. This novel antiviral known as baloxavir marboxyl, uses a substance that inhibits that cap-snatching action of the virus, so it can't make any proteins. So let's talk about these four different treatments. We all know all cell Tamivir, otherwise known as Tamiflu. They come in different capsules, and you can use it as a treatment. So if you come down with symptoms, generally speaking, you want to make sure that you start it pretty quickly within 48 hours of symptoms. And you can see here that generally speaking, the treatment is five days. For chemoprophylaxis, it's actually seven days. It is the treatment of choice in pregnant women, in hospitalized patients, and outpatients with severe, complicated, or progressive illness. And it is FDA approved for treatment of acute, uncomplicated influenza in patients greater than or equal to two weeks old. And it's also approved for chemoprophylaxis of influenza in patients greater than or equal to one year old.
So this is an oral treatment. Next one is paramivir. This one is intravenous only, and so it's going to be generally used in the hospital, and generally it's FDA approved for treatment of acute, uncomplicated influenza in otherwise healthy patients greater than six months old. You can see here it's a little bit more expensive as compared to the cheaper oseltamivir. It also needs to be renally dosed as well. Next one is Zanamivir. Now this one is not oral or intravenous, but rather inhaled. And because of that, it's not really recommended for treatment of severe influenza or people with underlying airways disease. It's FDA approved for treatment of acute uncomplicated influenza in patients greater than or equal to seven years old. And FDA approved for chemoprophylaxis of influenza in patients greater than or equal to five years old. And again, this is five days for treatment, seven days for chemoprophylaxis. Now, we go to this CAP-dependent endonuclease inhibitor, the thing that inhibits CAP snatching. This one is different in that it is PO, but you only have to give it once for treatment and once for chemoprophylaxis. So that's pretty convenient. It is FDA-approved for treatment of acute uncomplicated influenza in otherwise healthy patients greater than or equal to 5 years old or in patients who are equal to or greater than 12 years old who are at high risk of influenza-related complications. It's also FDA-approved for post-exposure prophylaxis in patients greater than or equal to 5 years of age. Again, no data on severe influenza. It's not recommended for use in severely immunocompromised patients or pregnant women. And one advantage with baloxavir is that it does not have to be renally dosed. If you look officially at their package insert, if the creatinine clearance is less than 50, it's not defined. And this table was really helpful. I'll put a link in the description below to the medical letter where we got this. And I highly recommend that you check out our videos on light as medicine. And check us out at medcram.com for more continuing medical education videos in topics such as congestive heart failure, EKG, asthma, and pulmonary function testing. Thanks for joining us.